Hey everyone, this is Ryan here, and welcome back to our series on endodontics. Like all of my videos, I'm going to be focusing only on the highest deal topics. And now that we've talked about pulpal anatomy and endodontic diagnoses, we're ready to talk about endodontic treatment. And in this video, we'll focus entirely on non-surgical endodontics, particularly root canal treatments. But don't worry, there's plenty to talk about with this subject. So first things first, we need to gain access to the pulp space. And we do this by drilling through the most accessible and logical place. And that would be the lingual surface for anterior teeth or the occlusal or biting surface for posterior teeth. And what we call the access preparation is actually the most important technical aspect of the root canal treatment, as we will see. As in operative dentistry, Conservation of tooth structure is critical, particularly the cusp tips and marginal ridges are structures that provide significant strength to the tooth as a whole. So we wanna leave those alone if possible. Part of the access prep is to de-roof the chamber to expose pulp horns and orifices. And a key concept is to attain straight line access to the orifice and apex. And that is, is, that is basically attaining as straight as possible a route for an endodontic file through this access opening to the opening of the canal, which is called the orifice, and the apical endpoint of that canal, which is called the apex. And we'll see what that looks like in the next slide. So this access prep is usually done with a round burr and or a tapered burr in a high-speed handpiece. And I know this isn't on the slide, but as soon as the pulp tissue is accessed, if not before you even begin the access prep, the standard of care is that the patient has a rubber dam on to ensure that saliva, blood, and bacteria don't leak into your operative field. So that's extremely important that the patient is using a properly sealed rubber dam for this procedure. So let's just talk briefly about the different types of access preps depending on what tooth you're working on. Now the detailed measurements of each prep are outside the scope of this video since again I'm only going to be highlighting information most pertinent for the part 2 board exam. So the incisor preps are triangular which serves several functions actually. One is that it ensures removal of the pulp horns and the process I talked about before being de-roofing. And so having this access prep include this wider portion coronally allows you to make sure that you can remove all of the badly inflamed or necrotic pulp tissue at the pulp horns. Because basically we don't want to be leaving behind any bacteria certainly if we can help it. Now, a second reason for doing a triangular access is that it helps prevent these marginal ridges, which we talked about before are crucial to the tooth maintaining its strength. And three, it helps us attain straight line access from the access opening to the orifice to the apex. So upper and um, upper central and lateral incisors almost 100% of the time will only have one canal, and you would utilize something resembling this triangular shape for upper, central, and lateral incisors. Now, for lower incisors, particularly laterals, they can actually have two canals, but you can utilize this triangular shape or even a more oval-shaped access as needed for your straight line access. And again, this is done through the lingual surface since it just makes sense to not want to leave this huge defect on the facial and also it's a better shot of getting a straight line access to the apex. So next we have the canines. And so upper and lower canines almost always have one canal as well and an ovoid oval access is often the shape of choice. Upper and lower premolars can certainly have two canals, 
One of the board examiner's favorite questions of all time is which premolar is most likely to have two roots, that being the maxillary first premolar. And so if it has two roots, generally it will have two canals. That being said, a narrower oval-shaped axis is the shape of choice for most all premolars. All right, so upper molars are a notoriously tricky tooth to perform a root canal treatment on. And that's because the vast majority of them have these three roots, which you would think means three canals. But the mesiobuccal root often, or more often than not, houses two canals. So the most common anatomical layout is four canals in total. And that's part of the reason why they're very frequently referred out to an endodontist. And here we see uh, the mesiobuccal 1 and mesiobuccal 2 can be uh, referred to as MB1 and MB2 canals. And the MB2 canal is often missed. And if one of the canals is contributing to some apical disease and the bacteria are not properly cleaned out, then the root canal treatment as a whole will most likely fail. So a missed MB2 canal is very common um, as a means of which a maxillary molar root canal treatment could fail. For boards, this is known, this access prep is known as a blunted triangle or a rhomboidal shape. So blunted triangle or rhomboid. Now lower molars are a notch easier than maxillary molars since there's no MB2 canal to worry about and there's usually less canals in general. The majority of these teeth have two roots, but the distal root, more often than not, houses two canals itself. So the most common arrangement for these teeth are three canals per tooth. But there's even the possibility of getting two canals in each root which would be four canals total, but that one's less common. Again, these are also often referred to endodontists, but there are general dentists out there who perform molar endo. For boards, this access prep shape is known as a trapezoidal access. All right, so we've talked about all the different access openings. Now that we have the canals accessed, what do we instrument them with? And when I say instrument, I mean to remove the diseased pulp tissue in the canals, to shave infected dentin from the canal space, and shape the canal so that we can fill it properly when we're all done with this step. So first we have the stainless steel hand files and this 0 0.02 taper. This 0 0.02 taper means that the file gets 0 0.02 millimeters thicker in diameter for each one millimeter you go down from the tip. And more on that calculation in the next slide. So an interesting thing about these um, files, about all these files actually, is they have a really cool universal color scheme. And so the bigger the number, the wider the diameter, as we'll see in the next slide. And I'll talk about this a little bit more after I finish talking about these different types of files. So started with the stainless steel hand files and having an O2 taper. And there are two sort of subtypes of these stainless steel hand files. The first one being the K file or Kerr file. And this one has a twisted square shape and it's often used with a watch winding method. And so watch winding is referring to sort of a back and forth clockwise and counterclockwise rotation as if you were uh, winding up uh, one of those analog watches. There's also the H file or headstrom file, which is a spiral cone shape and only cuts in retraction. So when you're pulling the file outward. And if you've ever seen Finding Nemo, they actually mention this file as having a teardrop cross section as part of the one of the dentist scenes. And that's exactly right. This does have a teardrop cross section. So we also have these nigh tie rotary instruments or nickel titanium rotary instruments. And these ones 
as opposed to the stainless steel ones, which have 0.02 taper, have 0.04 or 0.06 taper. So they get a bit thicker, quicker as you go from the tip. So uh, for these, the rotary looks similar to the hand files, except where the finger handle is, there's instead a latch, which fits into a latched handpiece that rotates at some manual set uh, RPM. Now they also make Naitai hand files if you prefer that material, being a little bit more uh, flexible. So again, going back to this color scheme, um, the bigger the number, basically the wider the diameter, again, as we'll see in the next slide that I have here. So the, the pattern here starts pink, gray, purple, white, yellow, red, blue, green, black. And then that white, yellow, red, blue, green, black repeats and repeats on as the files get thicker. And you can see white, yellow, red, blue, green, black right up here in the upper right corner. And you can see how the files are getting thicker and thicker as we go to bigger numbers. So if you remember that the white starts at 15, and if you can memorize this white, yellow, red, blue, green, black, and basically just keep saying it over and over and over again until it gets stuck in your head, you can remember the majority of the file sizes, which really comes in handy clinically and also on exams. So white, yellow, red, blue, green, black, white, yellow, red, blue, green, black, and keep saying it, and I promise it'll, it'll get stuck in your head at one point or another. So for file dimensions, we have these two important points along the cutting edge of the file. So D1 is referencing the diameter at the very tip of the file. So we were talking about all these numbers before. For example, a size 15 file will be 0.15 millimeters in diameter at its tip. And then a size 20 file would be 0.2 millimeters, a size 35 file would be 0.35 millimeters at the tip and so on. So that's how the number relates to its uh, diameter. Now we also have a second dimension, D2, or sometimes called D16, and that's because it's at the diameter 16 millimeters from the tip. And that's the point where the cutting flutes of the file end. So now this is where the taper comes into play because we need to know how much thicker the instrument gets from the tip as we go. So for a size 15 file, we know we start at a tip of 0.15 millimeters in diameter. Now for a K file, that's one of our stainless steel hand files, which are preset at 0.2 millimeters taper. So if we multiply 0.02 by the 16 millimeters, we go from tip to the second dimension point, we get a diameter at the D2 or D16 point of 0.47 millimeters. And so you can work that through for any size file and a file of any preset taper, 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06. You can plug in any numbers with this formula and it'll work out. So whether or not you'll get a question like this on the board exam, probably not, but certainly on and an endo exam or something like that for dental school, this could be a pretty popular question to ask. As long as you know the formula, you're all set to go. So um, a couple other instruments I just wanted to mention briefly, I don't have enough time to talk about them in this video, but we have Gates Glidden Drills, also mentioned in Finding Nemo, and that's to open the orifice for a straight line access for, um, for the root canal process. Bar brooches can entangle and remove things that are caught or stuck in the root canal. And a reamer is a twisted triangle shape and it's used by clockwise motions instead of the watch winding method. All right, so with these file instruments, there are basically two primary methodologies to cleaning and shaping the root canal as previously described. And that is the crown down method and the step back method. So here's our endodontic file and we're going in, we're shaping this canal, particularly where um, this infection has taken, taken place apically. 
So let's talk about the crown down method first. So crown down usually, but not always, is done with rotary instruments. And so you start by shaping the coronal third of the canal with a big file that's actually too large to fit the entire canal. And having a poor fit is actually ideal, as you can see in this schematic, because there's less surface in contact and thus less friction generated. And so shaping is more efficient while also you have a less risk of instrument fracture, which is one of the main endodontic complications as we'll discuss in a future video. So from there, you move sequentially down, the crown down, from big files to small files. And that's probably the simplest way to think about it. So you start with a large file, like a 35 or 4006, and you run the file into the orifice until you get resistance. Then you use successively smaller files until you get resistance and continue this until you reach the apex. And some of you may be wondering, well, how do you know when you get to the apex and where the apical foramen is? And that's a combination of taking an x-ray preoperatively and using a calibrated measuring tool, using an apex locator, which uses electricity, and or taking an x-ray intraoperatively with a file in the canal and seeing how close your estimated length was. So your goal for a root canal is to shape, clean, and obturate each canal to zero to two millimeters from the apex. And so the proper length from some coronal reference point like a cusp tip or incisal edge to this point is called the working length. And so creating this uh, little area here, if my mouse shows up right about here, is called the apical stop. And that about zero to two millimeters, on average one millimeter from the apex, helps confine instruments, materials, and chemicals to the canal space. So the step back method, by contrast, is usually but not always done with hand instruments. So you do start in the same way, however. You start with a bigger file, like a 35 or 4006, to shape the coronal third of the canal. But then once you obtain some coronal flaring, you pick up a smaller file and insert to working length. So now we go all the way down to the apex. And you start to step back sequentially. So you can use a 20 hand file and then a 25 and then a 30, all at working length. And then you can go up to, say, a 35, but then set the working length one millimeter shorter. So now you're only at this point, go up to a 40, and then now you're up to here, go up to a 45, and then step back and step back until you can flare out this entire canal properly. So I know these two methods are pretty complicated, but hopefully my simplified approach helps you to grasp these concepts and see how, besides their similar start at the coronal third, they're basically two opposite approaches to attaining the same goal of a properly tapered canal. So it's super important that between each file you use to shape the canal, you must irrigate or flush the canal with these chemical agents. So basically the, the process is file, flush, file, flush, file, flush, etc. And so one of the main ingredients here is sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach. And we use a very diluted bleach for root canals and it's an irrigant and it dissolves organic material. So organic, referring to bacteria. Now there's this there's also this other chemical called ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, which is called uh, EDTA for short. 
And so this chemical is a lubricant and it dissolves inorganic material. And so inorganic material referring to the smear layer of dentin being shaved off as we clean with the files. And so EDTA is a chelating agent since it binds to calcium and other inorganic elements. And then we have chloroform, which dissolves gutta percha in retreatments. And so gutta percha is something we'll talk about in, I think, in two slides from now uh, when we talk about obturation. So there's also these um, aerators that spin air into the canal as you clean and shape them. And the theory here is that the vast majority of endodontic bacteria are anaerobic and they don't like oxygen very much. And so this is great because root canal treatment is all about eliminating and killing bacteria. And if you're interested um, for some endodontic microbiology, the first time a tooth has an endodontic infection or an endodontic problem, uh, these bacteroides are the primary uh, bacteria that are present in the root canal system. And these are gram-negative, obligate anaerobes. So they actually can't live in the presence of oxygen. So that aerating process and lots of irrigation is really critical to making sure we take care of these bacteria. Now for a failed endodontic treatment, one that's being repopulated with bacteria, this Enterococcus faecalis or E. faecalis is the primary bacteria present. And that is a gram-positive facultative anaerobic bacterium. So we've accessed the canal, we've shaped it, and hopefully cleaned out all the bacteria. So now we want to seal it to prevent any bacteria from entering, or if we left some behind, surviving in this atmosphere by basically starving them from all resources. So filling and sealing the root canal system is known as obturation, which I apologize I was throwing that word out before without explaining what it means. And this word obturate means to block up or obstruct, which is basically what you're doing. So notice these um, gutta percha points have the same coloring system, this white, yellow, red, blue, green, black that we were talking about before as the files. And so you would usually try to match the size of the file with whichever, um, or match the size of the gutta percha to whatever file you last used. So you can fully seal the canal with the proper size. The main ingredient for the gutta percha and this um, sealer paste that you can coat them with is zinc oxide eugenol. And that's a pretty common board question as well. So um, how to use these is we can pick the proper size, seat it fully to working length, and use a plugger instrument, and you can heat it up to compress the gutta percha into the canal space. And that process would be referred to as warm vertical condensation. And or you can use what's called a finger spreader to create room in the root canal, which you can then place tiny accessory cones into that space. And that would be called or referred to as cold lateral condensation. So these two methods can be used in tandem or you, uh, one oper operator may prefer one method to the other. And then of course, perhaps most importantly, you want to place a temporary restoration and later a final restoration over the obturation to seal the access preparation from the ingress of bacteria from the oral cavity. All right, and that's it for this video, guys. I'm sorry it was so long, but it really is interesting, the whole, all of the instruments and processes that go behind a root canal treatment. So I really hope you guys did enjoy this video. If you did, please like this video and subscribe to my channel for more on endodontics and other things dentistry. Thank you so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video.